have this noted that uh, Ms. Byer is excused this evening to attend the Mayor's Arts Awards. Mr. Boswell. Present. Mrs. Danick. Here. Mrs. Duncan. Here. Mr. Mayhew. Present. Ms. Mumgard. Here. Mr. Schulte. Present. <clears throat> the Open Meetings Act is posted at the back of the room for your information. Um, I'd like to go ahead and turn this right over to um, Don Mayhew, um, who is the chair of the Finance Committee. Uh, thanks, Connie. So where we're at in the uh, process, just to uh, get us all up to date uh, with where we were since the last time we talked about the budget, uh, since that time we've conducted a, a series of one-on-ones with the uh, board members who are not uh, finance committee members. And uh, that was uh, Dr. Standish and myself uh, conducting those one-on-ones. Wrote down questions, concerns. Uh, Liz followed up uh, on uh, questions and responded uh, in writing where appropriate uh, to those questions. and. Then uh, we brought that information back to the Finance Committee, uh, which is Connie and uh, Annie and myself. We went through uh, all the information that we had, worked, made some tweaks on the, um, the proposed document uh, that we felt were the most representative of the uh, consensus of the uh, comments uh, that we were getting. And uh, we are here to look at where we're at in the process then tonight. So we're going to start it off with a uh, presentation uh, from Dr. Standish. And then uh, after that, we'll open it up to uh, some comments and questions. Good evening. Um, our work session tonight is really focused on development of the 1617 budget, and I always think it's important to do a little bit of historical context. So we know that revenue significantly declined to the school district when the housing bubble burst, so to speak. So there were many years um, prior to 2013-14 of restricted revenue where expenditures were placed on hold and our ability to keep up with growth was very limited. In 1314, state aid started to recognize our growth in the state aid formula, and our growth had a significant uptick in the number of students that we were serving. State aid also recognized that, and then we started to notice some of the valuation increases that came along with that growth. 1415 and 1516, we really focused on catching up with that growth. We looked at class sizes, we looked at instructional staffing. We also restored some of the systems and district capacity to support schools in the classroom. We advanced a major technology undertaking and plan, and we allocated resources to opening new schools. So this year's past budget that's coming to a close, opening the Career Academy, we had startup costs for Nuremberger Education Center and for Wysong Elementary School. Much of this continues at our work at 1617, focusing on class sizes, focusing on the parameters for instructional staff, continuing to build district-wide capacity, further advancing the technology plan, you'll see some of that tonight, and resources for starting up new schools and opening new schools. This budget proposal also includes an investment in early childhood, one of the community priorities that we hear repeatedly, and that is maybe a new dynamic that's brought to us tonight. So we'll walk through revenue slides, information about revenue and expenditures. We'll take a look at cash flow and we'll have time for feedback and questions. Much of the work to prepare this budget to this point is a major undertaking with data crunching a staff. I have with me Sherry Steiskel and Jill Polly, both directors um, that really lead that work. They dig into every detail. So as you have detailed questions, I'll look to the two of them to help and support that. I also want to recognize Kim Schmidt and Jess Jefferson, um, very instrumental to the finance team and have done some of the research that brought the information for you tonight. I want to point out that as we look at the calendar, we are getting more information out into the community earlier this year. The way the calendar fell, and really with this exceptional team, um, I gave them a bit of a challenge that said we've typically had our bu second budget work session where we get to look at all funds in mid-July. Is there any way we could do that at the second board meeting range in June? And they've taken on that challenge, and that's what we adopted in February when we put together the budget calendar. I would also want to make the effort here and now that if any community group, any organization would like a presentation on the budget proposal that we're taking to you to take out to the community tonight, that we stand ready to do that. All you have to do is call district office, ask for Liz Standish, ask for business affairs, you'll get to the right people and we'll get something scheduled. And we still have um, lots of time in front of us, lots of work in front of us, but we're excited to get this proposal worked on with all of you out to the community for input. We start with our funding pro sources. First, property taxes continue to make up the majority of our revenue stream at 50.7%. 
And I want to speak that most of our conversation tonight will be about the general fund, our general operating fund, and that's what's represented in this graphic. We also know that valuation and what happens with values throughout the community significantly impacts our resources. We are estimating that our certified valuation we would receive on August 20th would be an increase of 2.3%. Keep in mind, and we've had lots of conversation about it, but it's always worth pointing out that Lincoln follows a three-year process. So those market adjustments, valuation adjustments are called a reval year, which happens once every three years. So last year, signified a reval year, the year that we're currently in. So August 20th of last year, we saw that 6.2% increase. We now have two years where it's just going to be new building permits, personal property centrally assessed, and things that are annual. It's very important to think about the interchange between property taxes and state aid. We had lots of conversation about this during our 15-16 budget that we knew as our property value increased, that would impact our state aid calculation. And so this graph looks back at the past 10 plus years and just shows the relationship between property taxes and state aid. As your reliance on property tax goes down, your reliance on state aid tends to go up. And that's all driven by value per student. So when you're looking statewide and thinking about value per student, that all drives through the state aid formula. So when we have school districts across the state who are not receiving equalization aid, which is one component of state aid that school districts receive. So school districts receive state aid for serving special education, apportionment. The, pro the dominant source that school districts receive is equalization aid, which is meant to go and look at a school district, what can it raise with its local value, come in and make up the difference. So if your local value per student is lower, for example, Lincoln is about $5,000 per student, then you're gonna need state aid to make up the rest of your needs in the formula. The high in Nebraska is $59,000 per student and the average is $17,000 per student. So if you think about equalization aid and how many school districts receive equalization aid with the average dollars behind every student in Nebraska at 17,000, it makes a lot of sense that there's less and less number of school districts receiving equalization aid. We know that resources is something I've talked about for just a few minutes, but also needs is a huge part of that. So the increasing student enrollment, the increasing growth we're having, increases in demographic groups all go into that calculation where we take needs minus those legal, local resources to equal aid. We are projecting student enrollment to grow significantly again for the 16-17 school year. We are projecting an increase of approximately 950 students. That will put us over that 40,000 mark, approaching 41,000. And I think what's really worth noting here is that over the last five years, we've kind of swung around about a 2.5, 2.4% growth in students. So what used to be an incremental 350 to 500 students a year is now become an incremental 850 to 1,000 students a year. So that is a paradigm shift for us and something I think that we've been working as an organization and all of you as board members since 1314 to invest the resources in keeping up with that growth. <clears throat> the increases are not isolated to kindergarten or one get grade range. They are all throughout the city. We are now seeing that uptick flow through our high schools. So that's <coughs> been significant for staffing this year and it touches every quadrant of the city geography, um, very much all encompassing, which is different when you have growth everywhere versus just targeting resources on growth in one segment. It's important to note our historical property tax rate for Lincoln Public Schools. It has decreased seven cents in the last 10 years. It was 131, it now is around 124. And this graph shows the story of Nebraska and the efforts that were made with levy lids, increases in state aid, and some of the adjustments that were made through the legislature. We also know that we have a system that is built on property taxes. So Nebraska has a system that is built with property as the primary funding stream. In fact, the state aid formula, as we just discussed, goes and looks at 
what you can afford locally first through property taxes in the determination of state aid. Nebraska ranks 59th out of states, out of 50, for the percentage of resources received from state sources. So by design, we are heavily reliant on property taxes. We are estimating a slight decrease in the overall tax levy. And when we developed the finance parameters, or really all of you gave staff the finance parameters for the 2014 bond issue, um, the expectation was do it within the existing levy. And so we keep that 1314 levy rate on this chart for a reason because that's something that we keep an eye on to make sure that we're continuing to deliver on that parameter. So this would represent a very slight decrease in the overall levy for the school district. I think it's important to note that you'll notice a shift here. Um, for the general fund, this budget package we are proposing to levy a dollar four and a half. So half a penny would then shift to the building fund and we have several slides tonight where we can talk about the reasons for that and the needs that we're having in our facilities and in our building. Some of the assumptions for this budget include contract negotiations at 3.18, the valuation increase, the levy, state aid, and student increases. Don? Uh, I saw Matt had his hand up for a second, and if you had a quick question about one of those slides, I think that's fine, but we have about a half hour of content, so if you want to go ahead and uh, shoot that question out. Just the previous slide real quick, can you just re remind us what Qualified Capital Purpose Fund is? You mentioned the general and the building and the bond fund, but could you just come up? Sure. Qualified Capital Purpose Undertaking Fund is established by the legislature. It used to be litted at 5.2 cents just this past legislative session. They lowered it to 3 cents, and this would be where you could levy for qualified purposes. Hazardous abatement, um, there were government bonding, qualified zone academy bonds for those purposes without a vote. Okay. Great. Thanks. So assumptions, we also have our number for state aid. We are working on the assumption of the levy with half a cent going into the building fund for a total of $1.05, which is the maximum. And we have a student increase projection of 950. This graphic shows you a summary of the proposed changes. So when we look at the 2015-16 <laughs> budget, and when we take that budget and we roll it forward to 16-17, what changed where are the increases? What categories are the investments being made? So you can see negotiation salaries at 35%, school staffing at 33%, new schools 12%, technology 9%, early childhood 8%, and district-wide items 3%. So we'll take and look at these numbers for each category, break those out a little bit for you so you have a little bit of explanation and detail behind those, and we'll just take them one at a time and plug through them. So negotiations and salaries. Um, first, we have our negotiation package increase at 3.18. Every year we have a calculation that we call budget to actual staffing that is rolling forward, removing, for example, retirees and replacing them with new staff members. So that roll forwards our current budgeted staffing to what we would forecast the actual staffing to be for next year. We also have some work to do, much like we did with transportation last year, where we have a few classified groups where we would like to look at some adjustments to promote recruitment and retention of employees. This would be targeted work, not connected to the negotiated package, really for hard to fill and high transition positions. We also have a proposed pay rate change for high school intramurals. So people who are currently coaching high school intramurals, there's a pay rate change proposed. School staffing, a significant portion of our budget, and this is increases in school staffing. So this is of the increase, what portion is school staffing? And when we look at staffing, we know that we're growing in many, many areas. So we have our regular education staffing to address growth at 4.7 million. We have supplies and equipment to address growth. We also know that we have the strategic goal of graduation rate, so we have some targeted academic intervention funds for the middle level for reading and math. We also have a little bit of an innovation intervention assistance after hours. This is something where we'd like to be able to work with specific schools, specific programs, outside of school time to have interventions with students. The board has continually heard about and talked about students' social, emotional, and mental health needs. 
This is funding that will start to advance a plan where long term, we'd like to see a counselor in every elementary school. That's gonna take a number of years. We always have to match up fiscal resources and human resources. So we need to make sure that we're incremental enough that we're able to attract highly qualified, highly skilled, right fit people into the school district at a rate that we can do that. So this begins that work of having counselors, a staffing level of social workers, 0.4 at elementary, 0.6 at middle, and 1.0 at high school is the vision that we would head towards. And then also having some therapists for truly intervention in moments of crisis for students at the district level. On that same theme, we also have some increases related to nurses and treatment nurses in our schools. We would like to invest in second shift campus supervisors at all of our high schools. This is actually not a budget increase because we're able to decrease an equipment line after reviewing the budget, but it is switching equipment money to personnel money, so it is notable from a transparency perspective for the board and for the community. We have increases in special ed staffing, ELL staffing. Um, Nebraska is taking on a concept of unified sports through NSAA. This is an opportunity for special education students to work with regular education peers in, an impetitive, in a competitive setting. So bowling is the first sport and this is the cost to bringing that on. We've also been watching cross country as a sport for a number of years. We have more participants and a greater need for assistant coaches for cross country. This would be one at every school. And then we have the Career Academy. And as that program moves forward, we obviously have staff at the Career Academy. Their salary increases are not in the big number for the district. These are actually isolated because this is through the cooperative fund. <clears throat> new schools and new facilities. We are going to remove startup budgets for schools that we're opening. We're gonna put in a startup budget for more middle school and put in the operating costs for Wysong and Nuremberger. We are also going to staff the additions and make sure that we have custodial and utilities. I'd also like to point out that this is the utilities for increased needed district-wide. So that is in that number. We do know that with our continued investment in geothermal, we can estimate that a geothermal school would cost us 80 cents per square foot per year and a conventional system would cost us $1.30. So we wanted to make that point on the utility side that there is an investment that our community, our taxpayers through supporting bond issues has made that does impact that budget line. We're also proposing to outfit the front section of what's gonna be the future food storage facility on 7th and Hill. We've called it the Bison Building. Um, and this facility has a front to it that could create a district training center we could have a setup of a room that would be similar in presentation to this room, which is in very high demand. It is one of the best formats for presenting to large groups. We would not have the boardroom set up, but we would have the large projection and be very conducive to training along with classrooms and small breakout rooms. We find that we're using off-site locations more and more and more, and this would give us an on-site not required to pay to use an off-site location for training. When we look at technology, we have instructional technology coaches at the elementary schools, knowing that our Chromebooks are rolling into the elementary schools. We also have Southeast and Northeast, Northeast that are coming on with Chromebooks. And so coaches at those two schools, we have a need for an advanced filter feature. And we also have a need for a new business system. We're operating on what's typically called the AS400. It's a green screen environment. Um, it's something that's been in the district for potentially 30 plus years, 25 at least. Um, and it's the backbone for our financials and our human resource. We do have money in the depreciation fund, but we also know there could be some general fund expenditures with taking that on over the next couple of years. So this is a budget line to support that work. It would also be a budget line that would stay because we would have maintenance requirements related to building out that system. We know that we need someone in curriculum to help manage the digital subscription and the deployment of digital subscriptions to students and keep that in place. There's also been a desire from the board to have digital access for students extending hours. So we've looked at a bunch of different options and I think the overall goal for the community is that someone who at seven o'clock at night has some work they need to get done and needs access to viable, reliable internet access has a place to go. 
So we're looking at Northeast, which is one of the sites for Chromebooks as a potential place. Um, it may not be the library at Northeast because the library is very internal to the building. It could be another designated spot, but we are looking at staffing that into the evening hours, potentially Monday through Thursday. We're also looking at Lincoln High. We think that we might explore maybe some hot spots as an alternative. And we also want to look at the middle level to see if there's any gaps where a middle school does not have a nearby library that's open till that 8 o'clock um, and if there's some places we need to go. So this would create a budget line that then Mary Ryman, Kirk Langer would work with schools to say, you know your population, what do you think they really need? And we would work that out. But I know the board's desire is so that the community knows that there's a place where they could take their Chromebooks to get their work done. In early childhood, we know that we've had a community initiative related to Prosper Lincoln <clears throat> about increasing access to quality learning experiences in the early childhood years. So knowing that, we were having conversations this last year, and conversations really kind of centered around the idea of Head Start. And it's important to note that our early childhood program has a blended funding stream. So we have federal funds through Title I, we have funds through special education, funds through a Head Start federal grant, general funds, so there's blended funding streams that all come in to support our program. And we don't designate classrooms by funding streams, we have a very inclusive program. So one of the challenges we were facing is the new federal regs for Head Start was requiring an extension of hours. So it was gonna require any program receiving Head Start funding to go full day. So if we kept our current model with the blended approach, with the inclusive classrooms, and simply just made a decision to switch from a half day program to a full day program without additional investment, without additional facilities, we would be reducing our early childhood program essentially in half. Because we'd be, and it's not perfect, because not everything runs AM and PM. But in theory, we would be significantly reducing our slots for early childhood. So we worked through that problem and felt that it didn't match with the community priorities for Lincoln Public Schools to be significantly reducing access to quality early childhood at the same time that our community is asking for an investment in early childhood. So this, what this proposal would do is that Head Start funds would no longer be a revenue stream to that program. Head Start funds would then be a revenue stream to other programs in the community, and we, in general fund, would support that program. So we would maintain the same number of seats, the same number of classrooms with general fund as opposed to Head Start fund. What that will do for Lincoln as a whole is open up full day early childhood seats at centers, different locations throughout the community that then the Head Start delegate can operate and run. We also looked at our contract for Educare as we serve more four-year-olds where we do a payment for those. That's related to the state aid calculation and also some reconfiguration of staffing related to paras and special education increases. So that's an overview of the early childhood. District-wide items at 3%. In our curriculum office, we had a need for an increase in music staffing, an additional administrator for our ELL program, and a lead teacher to support our English language arts program. We are also looking at a coordinator position within student services and guidance and counseling switching that to an administrator position as we continue to invest in that area, as we have the past two to three years and increase the staff size, we need to increase the district support for that. We also had a desire to look at the Fresh Fruit and Vegetable Program. This is a federally funded program. It's an allotment of money that goes to our nutrition services and they then determine, based on the money available, how many schools can be served. So. What we found was not all Title I schools are served based on the money available. So this is an investment of general fund dollars that would go to that same program for the same purpose um, that would then ensure that all Title I schools could be served. Transportation is related to our transportation plan, which we've had lots of discussion about. It's also related to some transitional staffing for leadership of that program. CLCs, this is an increase in contracted services, and then some additional office investment there as far as FTE goes. We have cost of doing business changes in HR and risk management, and then we have custodial supplies and the addition of a custodial supervisor. So that takes us through our total for district-wide items. <clears throat> 
when you look at our funding sources for 1516 compared to 1617, that gives you the sh snapshot of general fund revenue increasing from 390 million to 397 million. When we do the one pager, we often look at kind of what the status is for cash flow specifically on this one. So in 1516, we had revenue and we had expenditures and we had about 10.4 million that we moved to cash flow. <coughs> in this budget proposal for 1617, we would draw 5.4 million from cash flow to fund the overall budget of 402 million. We always have priorities and needs that are advanced that are not funded. Um, and this represents that continued investment in counselors, social workers, and therapists. We believe we need a director of our ELL program due to growing numbers there. We have more groups that we have high transition, hard to fill positions, so recruitment and retention. Um, we have proposals from our gifted program. We're constantly monitoring school enrollment growth and looking at the administrative support for that. So you could have a school that previously had 380 students, now that they're up to 480, 520, is there a need for some administrative support there? Also monitoring our high schools as well, as we know that's the number that's continually growing. That's a need that's still in front of us. Other coaching assignments for growing participation as those numbers grow, and a technologically advanced scanning system for ticketing at high schools and Seacrest Field. We did have some transportation ideas that were advanced as far as an additional route supervisor and GPS for our buses. We did leave early childhood blank because we know there's a desire to do more, and this budget recognized, it recognizes a greater investment, but it's not going to increase the seats in Lincoln Public Schools. It is going to increase the seats in the community as a whole. Um, so that is about 1.3 million of needs that were advanced, not funded. <clears throat> We have a one pager, this is available online and on e-meeting so that you can read it, but this gives you just a snapshot of the summary. And now I'd like to spend, if you mind, just a few minutes on the building fund because we do propose half a cent in the building fund. So step one is to really think about our facilities as a whole. And in conversation, I think, with Ms. Mumgard, I said, you know, I think about my house and all the things I try to do at my house to take good care of my house and then you think about 68 buildings, over 7 million square feet, 1.2 billion of property value, and we do have 11 unde um, undeveloped sites. So we have a significant asset of the community in our facilities throughout the city. When we look at the building fund, the reasons a school district has a building fund and the reason you would use the building fund is site acquisition purchasing of existing facilities for district use, anything that would have to do with construction, alteration, um, and construction projects for new schools or existing schools. We talked briefly at the beginning about the Qualified Capital Purpose Undertaking Fund, and I already made note of the point that that is a funding stream that saw some reductions this last year from the legislative action. That would inhibit our ability to do some of code safety modifications um, elimination of accessibility barriers and indoor air quality in that fund. We have depreciation, which can only be used for equipment. And then when we think about maintenance, so just pure maintenance of buildings, we do have a budget line in the general fund. So this really comes down to a few themes. I think I have three major themes that I want to talk to you about for the building fund. And the first just goes back as a reference point to that student growth. And keeping in mind that we're constantly monitoring that student growth, we're keeping an eye on it. I know in the bond program when we put that together, we would have been using 2012-2013 student enrollment when we did that first work session in February of 13. That fall, we projected we were adding 2,200 seats through the bond program. And we've grown since then by over 4,000 in five years. So that changes dramatically when you're looking at facility needs. The planning committee invests a great deal of time monitoring the growth of the city, monitoring where lots are being developed, where building permits are occurring. Here's an example of the Lincoln-Lancaster County 2040 comp plan. Um, City Planner David Carey was gracious enough to join us and actually do a presentation to the group within the last couple months. And we know this is a plan that is currently being updated. So this is an update year for that plan, so that's something we watch closely. 
We also really find this graphic powerful because it shows you the growth. It's not just in one little slice of the community. It really is dispersed all around the community in all directions. So growth was really the primary concept we talked about with the building fund. I'd like to add two more. One is what we call student housing. And when I think about student housing, I think of current facilities, current students. And I, I think of North Star over the course of this last year, where we know that we're outfitting a regular education classroom, turning it into a science classroom. Just to be clear, that would most likely be a general fund expense, because you're switching some furnishing and fixtures of the room, maybe some flooring. We also have a project at North Star that involves more construction, punching holes in walls, moving walls, reconstructing a space to be more efficient, and that could be a building fund expenditure for us for this year. In addition to student housing and modifications for student housing that we have for current students, current schools, we also have life cycle. And one of the best examples is roofs. We know we have millions of square feet of roofs. We know that in this last bond issue, we had four high school roof projects, and I would imagine that bond issues will continue to have infrastructure in our new format moving forward as we move to the 10-year facility and infrastructure plan. A smaller project that was replacing a roof could be a viable building fund activity. Um, we would repair a roof, and we're all very proud to have schools where we rarely see a stained ceiling tile. Our, our team under Scott Wieskamp does a great job, and that is general fund maintenance. So when we think about the funds to support what we can do with facilities of the school district, we have to kind of keep that big picture in mind, and how do we make sure we have sufficient money to invest in, the, in our school's life cycle and the growth factor, which is just huge. This gives you a pretty good look at history. I actually really love this chart a lot. Um, <laughs> but it tells you, if you look back at the building fund, it was last levied at two cents. Two cents used to kind of be kind of a baseline that the school district tried to establish in 2007, 2008. It has been true that with putting the building fund under the levy limit of $1.05, that has pushed more to the bond fund. Um, so you can see that in our levy history as well. And so this really gives you a look back of the history. And you can go back that 10 years um, to find that 131 number around 2005, 2006 to see the efforts the school board has made to reduce the levy over the last 10 years. We always want to think about where we are in the state. We know we're a larger school district. We're 20, 227th out of 245 in per pupil spending. Um, our average is 10,500 compared to 11,619. And of the 245 school districts in the state, 206 or 84% have less than 950 students. So that gives you a perspective of how much growth we're taking on each year as a school system. And I want to make sure that I'm very clear that we are completely a resource to the community. So here's contact information once again for presentations, PowerPoints, materials. Um, we're happy to go anywhere, anytime to present information about the budget. And at this time, I think I got through that fairly in good time. So we, have, we want to make sure we have plenty of time for questions and discussion tonight. Wonderful. Um, Dr. Standish, I just wanted to thank you and your team for all of your hard work. It was a lot of work and a lot of things we asked you. So we thank all of you for that. Yes. Now I'd like this to open up this uh, to questions right now. Don. Uh, thanks, Connie. Um, as was mentioned earlier, uh, Barb Beyer is uh, representing the board at the uh, Mayor's Arts Awards. And she did send me some comments uh, that she asked me to uh, share with our uh, colleagues. And so I just wanted to read through this uh, email. Uh, I was about to say real quick, it's not real quick, uh, but there are some uh, comments uh, to be shared here. Uh, so this is from Barb. First, uh, it's proposed to expand our general fund expenditures uh, beyond our mission and mandate of K-12 education to include $1.4 million for a half-day Head Start. Half-day Head Start type services have not fared that well in third-party evaluations over the years. Gains are not retained among students. Half-day services actually interrupt the parents' work day since they have to leave work and transport their children to another care provider. I'm concerned that we may not have all our high school media centers open in the evening to ensure that all high school students can have access to the internet, which is virtually a requirement in order to complete their homework. This is critical to meeting our stated goals for on-time graduation. Local internet provider services are not robust enough to carry the load as we, the district, roll out our technology plan. 
I encourage that we reflect upon creating another recurring line item in our budget for early childhood education, which will not be fully reimbursed by the state. I'm very supportive of early childhood education, but half days are not effective, and we should be expanding the line items in our budget that are not directly we should not be expanding the line items in our budget that are not directly related to our K-12 taxing authority. That was number one. Number two, I have concerns with setting a precedent with nutrition services budget that takes uh, this fund away from being self-supporting to accessing our general fund for $174,000 in fruits and vegetables. I'm very supportive of fruits and vegetables, but it appears there may be emerging help on this issue from the U.S. Department of Education within the next year or so. I think taking nutrition services away from being self-supporting is a bad precedent and could weaken support for the entire program in future years. Number three, another precedent that is being proposed is to, uh, is to us is dedicating uh, half a cent of our levy to fund the building fund. The building fund is important, but I believe this is a line item that should come under our bond issues. Our classrooms have unfunded needs. Primary among these are increasing classroom sizes, particularly in the earlier grades. We should utilize our levy to fund more teachers and bring down our classroom sizes and leave the building fund for various revenues such as cell tower fees and our bond issues. Number four, I have expressed concerns about the nominal expansion of social workers to two days per week. To be effective, social workers need to be in schools three or more days per week uh, so they can do more than assessments and actually build relationships with families and connect them to community resources. This again is related to our strategic uh, sorry, plan and meeting our goals for on-time graduation. Number five, I need a report on the status of reading recovery. I've had reports that not all students who need reading recovery are getting the services they need due to budget concerns. Perhaps we need to use a portion of the $1.4 million for Head Start half day expansion to fully fund reading recovery. Number six, I requested information on the effectiveness of middle school reading and math interventions. I still have not received that information. The information I have received is very vague. Number seven, Cheryl Success School's implementation has a 15% return rate back to students' home schools after one year. Middle School Success Schools has a 21% return rate, and Yankee Hills Success Schools has a 15% return rate. After several years of implementing this program, we as a district are witnessing nominal success. The taxpayers cannot afford to continue to build new programs separating students with behavioral issues from the mainstream population. If success schools is indeed therapeutic and evidence-based, then it would be, then it would experience a higher level of success and be able to return more students to their home schools, allowing students with emerging behavioral issues to also access an effective intervention. We as a board need to revisit how much in taxpayer resources we are spending on success schools and if this expenditure is justified by the program's actual success rate. In closing, I regret that I could not attend tonight's budget work session, but I'm representing LPS at the Mayor's Arts Award. Kathy? I have a couple of questions about early childhood. Mm -hmm. I recall when we added, I'll start with the statement, because I, I recall when we added all day kindergarten, we had to add a significant number of classrooms, classroom space, because we couldn't accommodate all of the kindergartners moving from half day programs to full day programs. We could afford to pay for it because moving them from half time students to full time students, the ongoing expenses of the teachers would have accommodated that, but it was strictly space that, that limited us from putting all day kindergarten in. Am I remembering that correctly? Scott's nodding his head and so is Sherry. <laughs> so as I looked at what happened with the new federal mandate under Head Start and mandating that it went to full day programming, what would have happened to the numbers that we currently serve in our district had we moved <coughs> to that full day mandate with the students and what we're currently investing? I don't have exact numbers, but we know that we would have had to have el eliminated a number of slots, we call them, for our early childhood students. There were some other incompatibilities with the length of the year as compared to our teacher contract, some of the other added expenses we might have with custodial food service and those kinds of things. By letting go of that one braid of the funding, um, the delegate for Head Start funds will now be opening full day options. That doesn't mean that we couldn't do that eventually as a district, but our goal was to preserve what we currently have for early childhood space, allow that entity to go and open more full day options, as well as knowing we also have other options, including Educare in the city of Lincoln, so that we have overall more opportunities for 
early childhood slots. We've been doing registrations, and at last count, I believe, we had over 600 on the waiting list. So we know that there continues to be a need, and we, we couldn't see m making more of those students go on that waiting list. So in fact, with this new model, more children will be served because Head Start will still be uh, available to children in different parts. It just won't be in the school building, mm -hmm. correct? Correct. None of our preschool slots will be funded with Head Start dollars. So parents who want that Head Start, there is accessibility to that yes. across the district, yes. across Lincoln mm -hmm. and the surrounding areas. Mm -hmm. And we will still be serving a significant number of students at least the same number that we did last year in half-day programs, correct? Correct, and we had anticipated, um, if you recall, in the, oh, I believe, 2011-ish um, strategic plan, the board prioritized expansion of early childhood programs. That's been happening. We had been kind of on that trajectory, but as space has, has become an issue, we have to look at where we'll continue to have room for early childhood programming. We're looking at um, the community needs, and so we, we, we have to look at where do we grow from here, but we certainly didn't want to back away from where we had grown to currently. But I think my point more is that there are more opportunities, not yes. less, by yep. doing this. And that was the goal of all of those entities as we looked at those decisions, because we, we know there is just such a tremendous need. And how many classrooms would we have to add across this district if we went to a full day every day for all of the kids in LPS that need or want half-day programs? Because that would be a significant investment in real estate, in, mm -hmm. in capacity in buildings. Am I correct? Well, if you figure 600 students or so on a wait list and we have a KHO that's close to 600, it would be a, a larger elementary's worth of space that could potentially house full-day programs for preschoolers. Thank you. And so, Dr. Staven, my understanding is we will be serving more students in early childhood then, correct? As a community? As a yes. community, yes. Mm -hmm. So I just want to point out to our board that we are a community partner, and we decided to partner with Prosper Lincoln, and that is one of their goals, that we will help with early childhood. So I think we need to all be aware that that's very important to our city. Annie? Do we, do we know that the Head Start has been picked up by another community partner? The Head Start grant was up for um, reapplication this year, so one of the entities that we've partnered with is Community Action. They've applied for Head Start dollars. Educare has applied for Head Start dollars. So the intent is for both of those entities to continue operating with Head Start funding to provide those full day preschool programs. But like any time you're having to reapply for a grant, you have to wait and see if that money is actually awarded, which everyone anticipates it will be, but you don't know for sure. But that doesn't happen until at least later this month, possibly in July is what we've been hearing. And so of course the timing of that also was very interesting if you consider how budget staffing We've registered for preschool. The timing of that was another factor in our decision making, knowing that we would kind of be living in limbo with that, then, then having to adapt to the programming changes, it didn't seem like a good fit either. So this way we can continue on. Parents know their, their kids are enrolled and we have things set for next year. Any other questions on that? No, Okay. Lanny? Uh, I wanted to respond to uh, one of my colleagues' concerns in her email about the moving of the half cent from the general fund to the building fund. Um, and I guess before I respond to those, I'd like to thank the Finance Committee and staff for proposing that. Um, in 2013, the Superintendent's Facility Advisory Committee identified over $330 million in facility and infrastructure needs. And as Dr. Standish noted earlier, our expectation was that we met facility and infrastructure needs within our existing levy. Uh, so after the board prioritized those needs into three tiers, we submitted a $153 million bond issue to voters, which fully funded tier one, but left over half the needs unfunded. So we also indicated that we would use all available resources to go down that list as far as possible into tier two and three. And so resources that would be available to us would include savings from construction projects, savings in bond costs, and other funds. I believe that moving half a cent from our general fund to the building fund helps us meet those facility infrastructure needs within the existing levy just as we promised. Thank you. 
Lenny, Kathy. It's actually Lenny's question. When I first started observing the board right back in the early 90s, we had a 14 cent levy outside of our general fund levy that we could actually use to make repairs, to do those kinds of building fund levy. Mm -hmm. That went down to a dime like at the turn of the century, if I remember correctly, somewhere around there. I'm looking at your numbers here, so I'm just looking at the reductions. And then somewhere in the mid-2006, 7, 8, somewhere in there, they decided we had to roll it in under the general fund. Mm -hmm. And maintenance was deferred on a whole lot of places because we still had to pay for teachers, we still had to pay for uh, curriculum, all those things that go on inside the classroom. So it ended up moving all of those dollars to bond funds. Mm -hmm. We had a two cent allocation until it looks to me, if I'm looking at this correctly, to the turndown in 2008-9. And that's when we eliminated it. So I don't think it's fair to say that it's a precedent. In fact, the precedent would be that we had invested more of the general fund into facilities and that we're actually returning to be able to look at our budget and provide some of those day-to-day -day resources through the general fund. Am I correct? Yes. Thank you. Don? Um, not to spend a lot of time uh, saying me too, but uh, in terms of a half cent, uh, for the building fund. Uh, that is something that uh, I, I think is very important. Uh, one of the things, as Kathy mentioned, uh, we used to have uh, more uh, authority in terms of building fund. And then when that went away, what that meant was that uh, a lot of those types of issues had to be either come out of the, the general budget or uh, be uh, rolled into uh, bond, be included in bond issues. And historically, we've had a bond about every seven years. And so if we were going to limit ourselves to, uh, for example, purchasing new property to when we do a bond, that means we're only purchasing new property about every seven years. And the way that uh, we do it right now, where when we have opportunities that we've defined around the areas of town where growth is happening, and we are uh, in a position to be able to pick up some property that we may be able to make future use of uh, at, a, at an inexpensive price, uh, having some money put aside for that uh, just seems very intelligent. It gives us uh, agility and the ability to uh, lock down property that we might at some point be able to uh, put to good use uh, as a school building for a reduced cost. If everyone knows we're only purchasing property about every, 70 year, every seven years, uh, the cost of that property is going to go up quite a bit. Uh, also, uh, as we're uh, you know, going through the years, we have maintenance. One of the things we've talked about a lot, remember from my past uh, time in planning, uh, is uh, just the acres and acres of roof rooftop that we have. Uh, things like that, the maintenance that's required for that. Uh, also, as we uh, continue to talk about growth, uh, and uh, what's going on at North Star, for example, you know, it occurs to me that despite the good work that we did in our uh, 2006 bond, that it's possible we might be uh, in a situation where we need to invest in a portable or two again. And having some cash on hand to be able to take care of these things as they come up, I think, is, uh, is very important. Uh, so that's one thing that I wanted to uh, talk about. Um, another thing that I wanted to address is uh, some of the funding for uh, mental health issues. Uh, as we go um, throughout the year uh, visiting schools, talking to principals and teachers, one of the things that I hear over and over and over again is a growing need is resources uh, for mental health issues. This is a growing need not only in our district but in the community uh, in the, and in the, the country in general. And what happens is, is that as kids have more and more specialized needs, then um, that creates more of a burden on the uh, teachers in the classroom. And so being able to have people who are uh, trained uh, to deal with the needs that our kids are coming to the schools with, I think is important. In some of the conversations we had uh, as board members, there were some concerns about, uh, is this enough? And I shared that concern. But uh, in drilling down on that with staff, there was the realization that even if we were to somehow magically have all the money that we needed right now to hire all those positions, we wouldn't be able to hire that many of these skilled positions uh, in the next year. So what staff has done is they have uh, put together a five-year plan. They said, here's a picture of what we want to be able to look like, and here's a plan to get there over the next five years. And this is uh, the first part of that plan. So I'm glad to see that we're starting to address it I like the way that we're doing it. I think that that's very intelligent and deliberate. Uh, and that's something that I especially appreciate about this budget. Anyone else? Okay. 
Um, I think I would like also with join Barb in um, getting a f some information about reading recovery, if we could, and, and that program and where we stand at that. We've never really talked about that, so I think that's actually a really good question that she has put out there um, about uh, <coughs> where, yeah, where that program stands at this point. So I, I strongly believe it's a strong program and it's a needed program. So um, might be something for us to do. I also want to um, bring in there. Can that I can I just clarify? Yeah. Let me let me just ask. And I, I don't remember the specific uh, question without looking at it. No budget impact for reading recovery that we're talking about. Is it just to know what what we're currently doing programming wise? Just help me clarify so I make sure we get the data. She, her, she points out that she's had reports that not all students who need reading recovery are getting the services they need. And I've had a few comments of that same anecdotal. So the question would be, is that, is that true? Is our reading recovery as strong as it can be and should be? Okay. Perhaps that's the question. Yes, we can do that. Do we plan to put that through mm -hmm. committee? OK. Mm -hmm. um, I think another thing to want to come to, I mean, she's taken a lot of time to write it here, and it's very well written, is the, um, the question about um, the time frame and um, after school time, for technically speaking, and making sure that kids have a place to go to to access um, the internet. And, you know, we didn't really have a very, um, we didn't have a consensus, I should say, on how that should happen. And that's why we kind of put it out there as a plan of like, well, let's give it a budget, let's give it some money. and and ask those who are busily um, giving the services to doing the services, like what is the best recommendation? And I think I'd really want to put out there that this was really thought through and we really did discuss how should we and should we do the whole city and do we need to do the whole city? And I know, I know that nationally, isn't it? Did I say once it's one out of six kids nationally don't have easy access? I may be wrong there, please don't write that down. But. Um, don't have access to constant and good Wi-Fi. And, and in Lincoln, I think it's even less than that. I remember I said that to you. We, we have some numbers. John, do you have numbers? Do you know those numbers at all? I don't. I would prefer to check with Kirk Langer and give specific yeah. numbers to share for our families, but because there's a difference between access to email and access to the kind of internet you would need to be able to do homework and academic work. Point being, it's a national problem. And because it's been known that you know we're going more and more technically in our schools, and so it's a national problem. So we do need to approach it, and we do need to consider it. And um, I think I can state that for the financial committee, we thought this was one of our best ways of approaching it at this point in time. Um, without you know, it helps us also understand what is really the need out there. Um, kind of responding a little bit to. Um, Barb, because she's been part of that conversation in the technology committee too. But just wanted to really put that out there that, you know, we know it's there. Not 100% sure what it is, but we know we need to provide something. Um, good job. Kathy. What I recall from my years on the technology committee is that we know that there's Wi Fi available for kids to use in public libraries. We don't control the hours that public libraries are open. We also know there's a lot of hot spots around the city. I don't know that I'd want my kids sitting in McDonald's for five, six, seven, eight hours uh, doing homework. But we used to also survey our parents and ask them if they had access to Wi-Fi. And I think that's data John can probably find for us. And since we're moving to a more integrated Wi-Fi usage of our students with the, with the technology plan, do we ask when they go to middle school, uh, parents, do you have access to internet at home and do they check a box? And is, I mean, is it something as simple as when they enroll in elementary, middle, and high school that they can check that box and kind of have just a picture? And I, I get we have homeless kids, but I know the mission has Wi-Fi available.